All right. All right. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Perth Andover Baptist Church. I was sitting in my chair, and Sabrina comes up to me and says, you know, it's 1031, right? And I did not. So, um, right. Well, uh, let's get started. A welcome to you if you are new here, and a special welcome to you also if you are watching online. If you're new and you don't know who I am, my name is Nathan Drover, and I am the uh, lead pastor here along with Pastor Sheila, and I am excited to be in this place uh, with you as we gather to worship this morning. Um, just a couple of small things, some housekeeping things before we get, begin. Uh, the first thing I want to mention is that we are uh, a scent-free church. We have some people here who have allergies, so um, just uh, bear that in mind. Uh, as well, we do have children's programming uh, starting up and uh, e even now going uh, throughout the service. So for the nursery, kids... Uh, children ages zero to four. Uh, we have the nursery out there, and that's all ready to go. And then halfway through our service, we'll have children's programming uh, begin for uh, children kindergarten and up. And so uh, I would invite you to take advantage of that, especially due to the fact that our sermon series uh, this morning will be, uh, we're beginning a sermon series on uh, suffering, evil, and the goodness of God. And so this morning might be a bit heavy, uh, for children. And so, um, in light of that, I want to invite us to reflect on the fact that when we turn to the book of Psalms, which we often do at the beginning of church services, and usually the psalm that's read out or the portion of the psalm that's read out is, is kind of has a joyful note to it. It's an invitation to worship God and his goodness. And uh, certainly, uh, we want to worship God for his goodness uh, all times. And yet, so many of the Psalms look to God in the midst of a need, a need for help, a need for rescue, a need for struggle, um, and a need for God to act on our behalf. And so this morning, as we begin our service, uh, I want to begin by reading Psalm 121. It says, I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at, on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. And so this morning, I want us to remember that in the midst of suffering and challenge and evil and struggle, uh, God is our keeper. He is our helper who meets us. And so uh, we turn to worship that God who is our helper this morning. Let's pray as we begin. Father, I want to thank you for everything that you have done for us, for every single person who has been called here uh, and has met here in person and who is watching online. We just pray that you would use this service to accomplish your will in our hearts and in our community. We pray that ultimately you would be glorified and honored through uh, the worship this morning and that uh, as we sit here, we will be equipped to be your people for the world. So God, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. I'll invite you to stand and to sing with us. We're going to start the service by bringing back a song that came out during the COVID pandemic, and we sang it here a fair amount during the pandemic, but I think it's been a little while. Um, it's one of my favorite worship songs off of my favorite CD called I Choose to Worship, and it seems fitting that we start the service in the sermon series um, talking about worshiping God amidst all of our circumstances, per he is always good, no matter what's going on in our life.
And before you all sit down, I'll invite you to stay standing because we're going to do our children's song. It's also a favorite. We're bringing back My Lighthouse. Now, I couldn't review the actions because there's like a YouTube copyright on it and I didn't have the CD. But I feel like there's lots of waves happening in this one. If you remember it, you can actually come up here and dance with me. And then as soon as we're done our children's song, our children are welcome to head off to their Sunday morning river program. In my wrestling, in my doubts, in my failures, you won't walk out. Your great love will lead me through. You are the peace in my troubled sea. Oh, you are the peace in my troubled sea. My lighthouse, my lighthouse, shining. Darkness, I will follow you. My lighthouse, my lighthouse, I will trust the promise. You will carry me safe to shore. I want to invite uh, Dean up to, to uh, take the offering. This is an offering for those of us who are regular attendees and members here and do not give online. Uh, so let's pray for the offering. Father, I want to thank you for everything uh, that you have provided for us. And as we uh, give some of that uh, back to you now, we just pray that you would uh, use it to advance your will and your kingdom in uh, and through this church, in this community, and uh, even broader. And so, God, I just pray uh, that um, you would bless uh, each person who gives and uh, use this according to your will. In Jesus' name, amen. Just as a couple of birthdays, both birthdays are on um, Wednesday this week, connected to our church. So we have Alex Wright has a birthday on Wednesday, September 25th, as well as uh, John Dexter uh, Sadler, JD, has a birthday. So uh, happy birthday to both of them. If you got a bulletin when you were coming in, uh, then you can see all of the different groups and things happening this week. On the inside, we have things that are starting this week, and on the back, we have uh, just a whole bunch of different things listed. Uh, so I'm not going to cover all of them. Uh, just quickly, I'm going to knock a few um, off the, off the uh, list here, just to say that the Alpha Group is meeting again this week, so if you've been interested in that, uh, connect with 
Marianne, myself, or uh, Barb and Rob, maybe, or April, and, and we'll be able to tell you more about that. The manuscript Bible study is starting up again this Wednesday morning at 9 o'clock. Uh, so it's 9 through 11. We'll be looking at Mark chapter 10, verse 32 to 45. And uh, so as a result of that, there will also be no men's coffee this week. Instead, we do the manuscript Bible study. I do want to mention as well, Sheila's senior women's coffee group that meets on Wednesdays is meeting this Wednesday at Larley Creek at 11.30 for lunch. So even though they usually meet at 2 p.m., is that right, Sheila? I got that right? Okay, perfect. Um, And then finally, I want to just mention that Rodney's care group will be starting up this week as well. Uh, To spend a bit more time, uh, I'm going to talk about River Kids. I didn't talk to Kat in advance. I assume, Kat, you did not did you prepare anything to talk about? Probably not. Okay, she, I, didn't, I didn't ask Kat to or anything, so that's just me checking in, making sure she didn't want to say anything, but uh, I'll just say a few things about it. This is our um, children's programming that meets every second Monday, and it is for grades three to six. We've invited the grade sixers to come back, so uh, that's something to slightly correct on uh, that bulletin that I'll get uh, corrected for next week. Anyway, so uh, it'll be grades 3 to grade 6, beginning this Monday, September 23rd. And um, during these uh, meetings, we do Bible study with the kids, we play fun games with them, and we enjoy a snack together. So it is a great time. It's from uh, 6.30 to 8, if I didn't already mention that. And if you have any other questions, please get in touch with myself, uh, Kat, Sabrina, Charlotte, um, we'd be happy to tell you more about that. And then finally, I want to mention something uh, exciting coming up. So throughout the summer, uh, I have been meeting with uh, Xander Mann. At the beginning of the spring, he uh, wanted to be baptized. And uh, when we did our baptism service uh, back in July, uh, it it just didn't work out for him to be here and different things like that. But I've been meeting uh, throughout the summer with him, and we're excited in, to announce that we're going to uh, baptize Xander next week after the service. Uh, we don't want to wait for it to get too cold. I'm already a bit worried about that, to be honest. But Xander was very enthusiastic about it. I was like, Xander, it's going to be cold. Are you sure? And he's like, I want to get it done. So um, we are doing that uh, next Sunday after the service. So please uh, be praying for Xander. Uh, Feel free to write a card for him uh, in celebration of his baptism, and please plan to attend and support him uh, next week. And then I will finally just mention, uh, keeping this in the forefront of people's minds, uh, Pastor Sheila's ordination service coming up on October 20th, so it's about a month away, at 4 p.m. on a Sunday. So just mark that in your calendars, because I'm sure you will all want to be here in support of Sheila for that service. So that's all I'm going to mention, but there is more on the back of your bulletin. And now I'll invite uh, Pastor Sheila to come up and uh, lead us in prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you provide a listening ear at all times that you hear us, that you answer. And Lord, we just pray that we would remember to come to you daily and seek your grace, seek your face, and seek your help. Lord, today we just thank you for the beautiful weather we've been experiencing, the evidence of your creation as we look at the beauty in the trees, as we look at the color. We just thank you for that as well. We thank you for the opportunities we have to be out in nature, but also be out with others and celebrate your creation together. Lord, as we come today, we think of those who are sick. I think especially of Pam Warman and uh, back in hospital, and we just pray, Lord, that you would be near to her, that you give doctors wisdom, and we pray that uh, you would be touching her body. Lord, we pray for the River Kids youth on Monday night. I thank you for the efforts, the time, and the talents that are put into that, the planning, and we just thank you for that, and we know that Charlotte and um, Catherine have been in this week planning and getting ready for that occasion. We pray, Lord, that you would just 
bless in this time of ministry to our young people. We thank you for the Three Rivers youth that met last week, and um, we thank you for the 10 young people that came for that, for their, we pray that you would continue to work in their lives. We can pray that you continue to teach them and keep them close to you through these middle school years as they, as they meet, as they study your word, and as they're encouraged in their walk with you. Lord, we think of other ministries that are happening, the Alpha Group and all that have been mentioned. We thank you for that opportunity for growth, for spiritual development in each one of our lives. We pray that you would continue to um, minister to us in these ways. And Lord, help us to help one another to grow, to be accountable to you, to just draw closer to you in experiencing your love and your compassion and understanding. Lord, be with us as we have our time of service today. We pray that you would uh, bless in the service. We pray for um, Pastor Nathan as he brings the message. We pray for these difficult topics that are there, but just showing how in our suffering, in our loss, in everything, you are the light in our troubled sea. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. going to swap this around because it's just what I have to do. It doesn't work otherwise. Creature of habit. Creature of habit. Um, yes, so now is the time where we have, oh, Rodney is singly, signaling me. What? Oh, oh, yeah, sure. Sh- uh, sure. Yep. So, um, so Trish uh, used to be uh, a, an attender here, a member here. Uh, she used to work with the youth a long time ago. For those of you who don't know her, and uh, yeah, I guess, yeah, no, I, I guess, uh, okay. No, sorry. I just came in this morning, and I just wanted to encourage everybody because the Bible tells us to encourage and lift one another up and build one another up. And that's exactly what you guys did for me eight years ago. And many of you know me, but many of you don't know me. So I just wanted to say a huge thank you for those who have been following along my journey. And for those of you who don't know me, a really quick recap. When I met everyone here at this church, I was actually an active drug addict. The pastor at the time baptized me. I rededicated my heart to God. This whole church has stood by me. I have family in this church. I have aunts, I have grandparents, I have sisters, brothers, uncles, and I am so blessed. And then this church took a chance and hired me. I had no idea what I was doing and started school. They stood by me 100%. And I just wanted to say thank you to you all so much um, for believing in me, for standing by me. And it'll be eight years in October I've been sober only because of the love of the people in this church. And also uh, graduating Acadia, so my big announcement is I just accepted my first pastor position. So, (coughs) as of of October 1st, I'm gonna be Pastor Trish in Parsboro, Nova Scotia. Pray for them. And I just wanted to share this scripture with you. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, stand firm that nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. So everyone in here who labored for the Lord and stood by my side, it has not been in vain, and it will continue to not be in vain as you come along others. So I just wanted to share that. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Trish. Maybe, uh, why don't, would you mind actually, do you want us to pray for you? Would, would you like to come up and, and I'll just pray for you as you begin that ministry? And Yeah, so, 
Does Sheila want to come up too? Sure, we're improvising things a little bit here. Um, yeah, I, I just think it would be appropriate to uh, pray for you and for God's God's blessing upon you. Sure. <laughs> and know that I could do it, but I think it's very important that this church take part in this um, celebrating time because this victory belongs to God. Yes, that it belongs to everyone here. Sure. Yeah. So let's let's pray. Trish, I, uh, God, I want to thank you for Trish and for the ways that you have worked in her life. I just pray now that you would. Uh, bless her as she begins this ministry. Give her an assurance of your calling and grace and presence. Uh, give her boldness in her ministry. I pray that you would be uh, working in the church where she will pastor. Uh, give her the wisdom needed to shepherd those people in your way and uh, your story. God, I just pray uh, that you would continue to accomplish your will through her and that uh, ultimately we would see uh, your kingdom bear fruit in Trisha's life and in the lives of others because of her in this new ministry. So God, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, thanks, Trish. Bill McNeil would be so proud of you. <laughs> He'd be crying. All right, well, uh, now as we turn... Uh, to God's word to hear what he has to uh, say to us and why it matters. Uh, let's just quickly pray once again uh, in preparation uh, for this time. So Father, as we take a moment now uh, to hear from you, I just pray that you would use the words that I speak uh, as your words to speak to our hearts. As we confront the pain, uh, the suffering, and evil in this world. Show us your love, your goodness, and that you care. When faced with pain, help us to believe in and see the possibility of hope. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. As a 10-year-old child, Brenna loved basketball. She was tall for her age, and she dreamed of playing in the WNBA. Although she was only in community basketball every game and every practice, she gave it her all. Basketball was her safe place, a refuge from home. For months, four months earlier, in August, her grandmother's fight against cancer had come to its inevitable end. Brenna had prayed and prayed for her nan to be healed. But in the end, 10-year-old Brenna was left trying to process the grief of never being able to see her nan again. Two months after that, in October, her parents called her and her siblings downstairs. We have something to tell you, they said. As the three of them sat on the couch, their parents broke the news. Your dad is going to move out of the house, Brenna's mom explained. He made some choices that require us to be separated for a while. But for Brenna, this was too much. As tears streamed down her face, her mind was filled with questions. Why would my dad leave us? Why would he make a choice that would take himself away from us? Why couldn't they work it out? But at least she had basketball. And so as November started, she put everything that she had on the court. Basketball was the one piece of stability in her life where things uh, still made sense. But then, later on in November, that also changed. One evening after basketball practice, Brenna got into her mother's car sobbing. The shame, the fear, the confusion was overwhelming. As a 10-year-old, she couldn't name the evil that was done to her. All she knew is that she felt shattered, and she was never going back to basketball again. It wasn't until high school that Brenna would be able to name what had happened to her that night. 
she had been molested. In the years in between, life wasn't much easier. Brenna's mother was a Christian who read her Bible every day. And so Brenna grew up going to church. As she sat in church, she would hear worship songs declare that God is good, that he is our comfort and joy, and that he is with us in the hard times. She would go to youth group where the youth pastor would talk about things like the sins of lying or disrespecting your parents. But on the sources of her suffering, the church was silent. Brenna never heard anything about what to do when your nan dies of cancer. No one ever explained where God was in the midst of her parents' separation. And there was certainly never any mention of sexual abuse. And so Brenna came to the natural conclusion, the God of the Christian church was either not big enough or not caring enough for her problems. And so Brenna decided that she wouldn't care too much about God. She would continue going to the church to appease her Christian mom, but when she turned 18, then she would be done. It was during the first week of her seventh grade that Brenna started to notice she was different from other girls. All the other girls in her class came to school with decorated binders. They had cut out magazine pictures uh, of musicians and actors and put them on the front and back. And one of the things that all of these pictures had in common was that they were always of attractive men. One day, Brenna invited uh, her friend Sydney to her house to help her decorate her binder. She wanted to fit in like everyone else. And so she put some men on there. But after decorating it, she instinctively said, I, I wish I could put like a girl on there. But that's weird, right? Sydney, being more mature for her age than 12 might suggest, simply said, why couldn't you put a girl on there? And so Brenna did. But the next day in school, Brenna's binder drew some attention. You put a girl on your notebook? Isn't that like gay? Before Brenna could say anything, Sydney spoke up for her. That's not gay. She can have cool humans on her notebook. And just like that, everyone in her class moved on. Well, everyone except Brenna. Because this small experience made one thing crystal clear to her. Brenna could never let anyone know. If people knew that she was same-sex attracted, she wouldn't be safe. She would be condemned, rejected, hated. And just like that, shame heavier than the whole world tied itself around her. It certainly didn't help that many so-called Christians like the Westboro Baptist Church proclaimed that God hated same-sex attracted people. Same-sex attracted people went to hell, or at least that's what Brenna heard. And she heard them loud and clear. And so Brenna told herself, maybe I'm not gay. She said this over and over and over again. She would say it hopefully when a boy in her class noticed her. She would say it fearfully when she saw protesters with signs of fire and messages of hate. And she would say it with tears streaming down her face as she cut herself at night. Lord, if you were real, would you just make me straight, she prayed. She writes every night, every night single night for what felt like years. I begged the God who didn't really care for me to make some way for me to be able to experience the goodness of forever with him. And you know what changed? Nothing. My prayers became more desperate and my arms more scarred as my attractions continually brought me right back to the same place. Shame was working overtime in Brenna's life to convince her that she was worthless, that she would never 
be loved if she was known. Not by God, not by her church, not by herself, not by anybody. As time went on, Brenna began attending a new church. And as it turned out, she actually began to like it. Keeping her sexual attractions a secret, she made friends there. And they were close friends. They hung out on the weekends, and their Wednesday group was the highlight of Brenna's week. And then when she was 15, she received the message from one of her youth leaders. Brenna, are you gay? One of the youth leaders had found Brenna's secret blog that she used more or less as a private journal. There was no real way of denying it. Her secret was out. At that point, Brenna thought her life was over. Shame had told her that if this had ever come out, she would never be loved. Christians had told her that too, and worse. Brenna was on the verge of losing all of her friends. And so she was faced with a choice. Does she stop responding and just never go back? Or can she find a way to do damage control? Eventually, she decided that she could still go to the youth group and just avoid her leaders. After all, more than 100 kids came to the group, so maybe she could just get lost in the crowd. But 25 minutes after the group began, the youth pastor named John found her. He came up to her and asked, Hey, Brenna, can I talk with you later? Well, as you can imagine, for the rest of the night, Brenna's anxiety was through the roof. Her heart pounded. She was nauseous. She wanted to run. But John found her again later on. Stepping into a side room, Brenna was ready for the hate, the rejection, the condemnation. She was ready to be told she could never come back. Brenna, John said, I just need you to know that lots of Christians wrestle with same-sex attraction, and I'm really glad you're here. Then he walked away. It took Brenna a little while to realize what had happened, but with this simple sentence, which represented a much larger sense of belonging and love, shame suddenly had less power in Brenna's life than it once did. But Brenna still disliked herself, and in particular, she disliked her body. As all high school teens do, Brenna began to feel the pressure. She began to feel the pressure of what would come after high school, the pressure of living up to Christian expectations that she didn't believe in or share, and the pressure of what magazines and TV shows told her that she should look like. Over time, this pressure became anxiety and self-hatred. She wanted to be super tan, unrealistically skinny, and totally ripped. Those are her own words. But that's not what she saw when she looked in the mirror. And so in an attempt to move closer to that ideal, to lessen the pressure, to be someone she could look at and love, she started skipping meals. And then as time went on, she began to expel the food she ate from her body each night. And that's how Brenna's eating disorder began. After high school, Brenna found herself in a place most of us probably wouldn't expect from the way that I've told her story so far. She found herself in Hawaii as a trainee with Youth with a Mission, or YWAM. And YWAM, if you don't know, is a Christian's mission organization. In other words, Brenna was training to be a missionary. Well, kind of. The truth of the matter is, Brenna was more interested in spending time in Hawaii surfing, dating girls, and smoking weed than going on Christian missions. But the YWAM program enabled her to be in Hawaii. And so, Christian missionary training was just the price that Brenna would have to pay. But it was through that training that everything began to change. As the trainees were getting to know one another, one of the first things they had to do is share their story. And Brenna was just not interested in this at all. 
As they sat, sat around the campfire each night and people shared, she felt like everyone's story was just too cliche. They all contained an element of sorrow, sure, but they always concluded with how good God was, how God had solved all of their problems, and how their lives were essentially now perfect. And Brenna just could not relate to this, because the truth was God hadn't solved all her problems. Her life wasn't perfect. Her ongoing eating disorder and its shame were the proof. And so she decided she'd make up a story. Well, the next night, as more people shared their stories, it was more of the same, until Hannah began to share. I have an eating disorder, she said. And as Hannah continued, she shared her story as it was. It didn't end with God completely healing her. It didn't end with God making her life perfect. Instead, it ended with faith. I'm not really sure what God is doing, Hannah said. I still struggle, but somehow I think I know God cares about this. Now, at first, this made Brenna extremely angry. How could Hannah claim that God cares about one of the deepest struggles in her life? If that was the case, then why wasn't he doing anything about it? Well, after a little while of silently wrestling with this, Brenna couldn't help but ask her directly. They were in the middle of Costco on a shopping trip. As their paths crossed in the aisle, Brenna walked up to Hannah and blurted out, Hey, what did you mean when you said God cares about your eating disorder? Taking a moment and seeing the pain on Brenna's face, Hannah replied, You struggle too, huh? Brenna's response was a simple nod. But right there, in the middle of Costco, Brenna confessed her secret struggle. There was no magical word or simple answer that Hannah gave. Instead, they began walking together, both literally in Costco and figuratively in life. Over their time with YWAM, Hannah showed up time and time again for Brenna. And when she did, she pointed Brenna to Jesus. And over time, Brenna began to pray. It wasn't easy, especially not at first. Sometimes it involved tears. But when Brenna sat down at the table, she pressed her palms together, feeling her dislike for her body and her broken relationship with food. She learned to pray. Lord, thank you for a body that functions and food that sustains. Would you be enough for me in the temptation and incongruent feelings? Her life still wasn't easy, far from it. But as she prayed this prayer every time she ate, she learned to rely on Jesus. It was years later, January 16th of 2018, that Brenna woke up in a padded room. Everything was white. The only object in the room was a bed. There was also a simple bathroom and one glass window to the outside with security wiring. Brenna was in the psych ward. A lot had happened between Brenna's time at YWAM and January of 2018. For starters, she began following Jesus with everything in her. Soon, she found herself leading musical worship at church. Then she was invited to teach the Bible, and by the end of it, she had begun working as a youth pastor and studying at a Bible college. She had also gotten married to Austin, and yes, Austin is a man. Brenna is still same-sex attracted to this day, but she was also in love with Austin. Everything from the outside seemed to be going well. But in August, the anxiety started. At the grocery store, when everything seemed to be fine, her heart began to pound and panic began to set in. By the end of September, Brenna was on medication and in counseling. And as she waited in the therapist's office, she would pray for healing. I know you see me, and I believe you can heal me. So won't you heal me, Jesus? At the same time, Brenna wasn't sleeping. She was lucky to get two hours of sleep a night. 
and this went on consistently for months. Eventually, intrusive thoughts began to creep in. She needed some relief. She needed peace. She needed rest. But it never came. Jesus, it seemed, would not be enough in this moment. He was not going to rescue her now. And so Brenna eventually concluded that there was only one way out of her suffering. She would take her own life. On January 15th of 2018, she woke up at 2.45 a.m. Once again, she barely got any sleep. But with a plan in place, she knew she had one day left to live. By this time tomorrow, her suffering would be over. As she went about her day, she connected with those who were most important to her. She hugged her friends a little tighter than normal as she said goodbye. She was about to leave her pastor's office when a woman from the church opened her door. Brenna, do you need to go to the hospital? No, 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 I, I'm fine. I'm okay. Brenna, just think about it for a few minutes. Would there be any sense of relief in going to the hospital to see if maybe someone who knows what's going on could get you some help? As Brenna began to cry, she nodded, yes. After finally being admitted to the psych ward, Brenna was placed in her white padded room. As the door slammed shut behind her, she began to cry. She began to cry because she was completely alone. No one was there to talk to her. There were no phones, no TVs. There were no books to read or pictures to look at. She was alone. Wishing she was dead, with her eyes closed, an image appeared in her mind. It was a picture of a billboard with the words, with prayer, make your requests known. Full of anxiety of what would come next, through tears and sobs, Brenna prayed the only words she could. Jesus, you haven't healed me, but would you at least be here with me now? And almost immediately, Brenna's eyes closed again. She fell asleep. And for the first time in months, she slept more than two hours. For the first time in months, when she woke at 7 a.m., she felt rested. For the sake of time, we need to stop there with Brenna's story. But there is much more to it. There were many positive ways that God worked in her life that I didn't include. But there was also more pain. As Brenna's life continued, she suffered a miscarriage and the horrendous grief that came with it. She became suicidal again where she unsuccessfully attempted suicide. And she continues to live now with the diagnosis of bipolar disorder. We've spent, we've spent a lot of time this morning listening to Brenna's story. And there are two main reasons we've done that. The first we'll talk about now, and the second we'll talk about a little bit later. This morning we, began, we begin our series, Suffering, Evil, and the Goodness of God, Confronting the Problem that Faces Us All. This series is about the problem of suffering as we experience it in our world. And this is the first reason that I spent so much time telling you Brenna's story. It's because it illustrates what the problem of suffering and evil truly is. Throughout the ages, philosophers have often discussed the problem of evil at an intellectual, philosophical level. It goes something like this. If God is willing to prevent evil, but not able to do so, then he is not all-powerful. If God is able to prevent evil, but not willing, then he is not good. But if God is willing and able to prevent evil, as the Bible teaches, then why is there evil at all? Now, I intend to address this intellectual question as this series moves forward. But with that being said, Brenna's story shows us that the problem of evil and suffering is not only an intellectual problem. As we hear Brenna's story, 
None of us think that if some philosopher could just give her a really solid explanation as to why God allows evil, then that would make everything better for her. No, the problem of suffering and evil is much deeper than an intellectual problem. It is just as much an emotional problem, a relational problem, and a spiritual problem. The problem of suffering is about the pain you feel when, like Brenna, you've prayed for years for things to change, but they don't. It's about the tears you cry as you visit your loved one in the hospital, knowing this may the last, be the last time you see them alive. The problem of evil is about how you can possibly survive the next day when you're being abused today. It's about living in a war zone with, where bombs fall and bullets fly. It's about how a survivor of sexual assault tries to find healing. The problem of pain is about how we can trust God when these types of things happen all around us. It is about whether God is truly good, whether he truly loves us. It's about whether hope is possible and whether there's meaning in our suffering. It's about whether we can know in the depths of our souls that God cares about each one of us. The problem of suffering and evil is about how we live in this broken, fallen, and often evil world. Or to put it another way, it's about discipleship. And Brenna's story illustrates this. What she needed in the face of her shame was a community where she belonged. As she continues to struggle with her body, she has learned to pray honestly before God and rely on him. And as she learned the power of confession in Costco of all places, she learned to find God's grace and care for her suffering. And so the problem of suffering is not just about how we can make our suffering stop. That is great if we can, but when we can't, the problem of suffering is about how we can be formed into people who can endure it with hope, faith, and joy. And that, in a nutshell, is exactly what this series is about. But before we begin this journey, today we need to answer one simple question. Is this even possible? Is it possible to be a people who can endure? Is it possible to have hope in the face of pain? Well, the Bible and the Apostle Paul believe that it is. Listen to his words from Romans 5, verses 1 to 5, according to the NIV translation, and the words will be up on the screen behind me. He writes, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory, or more literally translated boast, in our sufferings. Because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. Now, trust me when I say that I know this sounds a little crazy. I mean, the first two verses are fine, right? We have peace with God through Jesus Christ by faith. He has given us grace. We have the hope of the glory of God. Now, we might not even know what all of that means exactly, but it all seems pretty typical of what we might expect to hear at church and find in the Bible. But then in verse 3, Paul takes a surprising turn. Not only this, but we also boast in our sufferings. Let's just sit with this for a second. Paul says that Christians, those who have placed their faith in Jesus, can boast in their suffering. Now, I don't know about you, but I'll be honest, that's just not where I'm at. 
a couple of weeks ago, I had a kink in my neck from sleeping on it funny so bad that I could barely move out of bed. And boasting about it was literally the last thing on my mind. I just wanted it gone. And that's not even really an extreme form of suffering. But Paul is convinced that there is a way of, to experience suffering in light of Jesus that enables him and other Christians to boast in their sufferings. Paul has been discipled in the way of Jesus in such a way that suffering does not crush him. Rather, he can boast in it. And he expects other Christians to be able to do the same. Paul gives us a bit of an explanation as to how this is possible in the next verse. Paul does not boast in suffering because suffering itself is somehow good. In verse 4, he explains that we can boast in suffering because through endurance and character building, suffering can produce hope. And it's important to point out that this is not an empty hope. In verse 5, Paul says, and this hope shall not put us to shame. Paul is not asking people who are sick to hope in healing in this life when it might not ever come. It's not an optimistic but ultimately false hope. No, Paul is saying that our suffering can produce a hope that is as sure as the fact that you're hearing these words right now. He is saying that this hope is 100% guaranteed through Jesus Christ. And so, whatever that hope might look like, Paul's answer is clear. Is hope even possible in the midst of our suffering? Yes. Because of Jesus, somehow, we can become people who live with with certain hope, faith, and joy in this broken world. Now, once again, if you're a bit skeptical about this, especially if you're in the midst of a place of suffering right now, let me just say again, I get it. I've known many people whose suffering has crushed them. It didn't produce endurance, character, or hope. And perhaps that's even true of you. And so even if Paul has some way of thinking about and living through suffering that produces hope, it might feel completely foreign to us. What Paul says here might still seem simply unbelievable. And this is the second reason why I spent so much time sharing Brenna's story with you. If you told me about all of the suffering Brenna endured without saying anything else, I would simply assume that it had crushed her. I would certainly not expect her to say something like this. In her book, she writes, five and a half years out of the psych ward, bipolar diagnosis and all, I have come to know Jesus in a way I could never have known him without a need. Even though I still struggle, I am deeply thankful for the redemption God has sown through my suffering. Why? Because the intimacy I have gained with him and the comfort I have come to know wouldn't be apparent if I hadn't had these uncomfortable and incredibly human ailments. Somehow, through all her suffering, Brenna has found that faith, redemption, and hope are possible. Not because her suffering has ended, but somehow because of Jesus. Now, I hope that This is abundantly clear, but in case it isn't, let me say it now as clearly as I can. I am not saying that believing in Jesus will magically make suffering easy. I'm not saying that if you just believe, then this will all automatically work out for you. Rather, what I'm saying is this. The problem of suffering and evil is about how we live in this broken, fallen world. It is about how we are discipled in a way, in the way of Jesus, to endure suffering and resist evil with hope, faith, and joy. And so in this series, we will seek to be discipled in Jesus' way when it comes to suffering, evil, and the goodness of God. 
Beginning with Scripture's story, we will try to understand why we suffer, why evil happens, and what God is doing about it. In the end, we will see that even in the face of the deepest suffering and pain, this story, I believe, gives us the intellectual resources we need to endure suffering. It shows us that our suffering matters, that God is truly, holy, good, and that we can have hope because of God's power of redemption through Jesus Christ. Then in the new year, because that'll take us up to Advent, we, look, we will look at specific Christian practices. These discipleship practices will help form us, if we put them into practice, people who can endure suffering and resist evil. We will look at what it means to pray laments, to offer forgiveness, and show hospitality to the broken. We will learn to confront sources of evil through prayers of petition, the pursuit of justice, and even simply by seeing the pain of others. And as we do these things, as we learn to see ourselves as part of God's grand story, and as we put these disciplines into practice, we will be able to do what Paul talks about in Romans 5. We will have the tools to become a people who have a greater ability to endure suffering. We will become a people who reflect the love and character of Jesus in the darkest places in our world. We will become a people who have unshakable hope, confident faith, and even joy. And so at the beginning of this journey together, I want to leave you with one final question this morning. In the midst of your suffering, in the midst of all the evil and brokenness in the world, would you dare to believe that Jesus makes a difference? Would you dare to believe that maybe your suffering has meaning even if you can't see it right now? Would you dare to believe that even in the face of pain, there is the possibility of hope? Let's pray. Father, we come before you now, bringing all we are to you. We admit we would prefer not to have to do this sermon series. We would prefer for there to be no suffering, no evil, and no pain. At times, the things we experience seem so big. They're often so painful, we don't know how we will endure them. And yet we come to you now, daring to believe that hope is possible. We come daring to believe that Jesus makes a difference. And so we ask that you would form us into a people who can do what Romans 5 talks about. A people who can endure, reflect Jesus' character, and live with hope. Even though these things may seem impossible now, we trust that all things are possible with you. And so we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As the worship team comes up and, and gets ready for our final song, I want to make one more announcement following the start of the sermon series. And that is that I have created a Spotify music playlist to accompany this sermon series. Um, a lot of it is songs that I listened to as I went through some of my own suffering of my, my cancer diagnoses and all of the treatments and surgeries that came with that. I know Marianne has also contributed and I think will contribute more to it. And, and if you do have songs along the way that you think should be added to the playlist, you can message me. But the point of this playlist is for it to accompany you through the journey that we're going to go on of this lament and crying out to God and then through worship 
um, worshiping in all circumstances, and finally to finding the hope and the joy that we can find in Christ and the hope of his coming kingdom. So I called it a musical journey through lament, worship, and hope. And I think we're going to share that on the Facebook page this afternoon. Um, so you can check that out if, as we journey through the sermon series, and especially if you're someone who's journeying through your own time of suffering. I encourage you to make use of that playlist. For now, I invite you to stand and sing the well-known hymn, It Is Well. I know by the end of the sermon series, I hope that we will all be able to sing this even louder, that it is well with my soul.
join in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he reigns as king over God's kingdom and to come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And I just want to share one verse in Psalm, in Psalm 34. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their cry. God's eyes are on us in our cry. And during that time, we have assurance it is well with our soul because Christ died for us. And God sent that compassion and the needs that we have, and he meets, that, meets us in our pain. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for meeting us in our pain, in our stress, in our sorrow. Thank, us for the, thank you just for the assurance that you hear, that you answer our prayer, and your spirit is in us, working in our lives. We pray that as we go out from here today, we would understand that even when things are wrong in our life, that you're there, we can turn to you for peace, for comfort, and you understand our needs. You don't judge us for our shame and our needs, but you are there to help us. We pray that you would just lead and guide this week. In Jesus' name, amen.